On August 9th, 2014, the nation was shocked to learn that an unarmed black teenager was shot to death by a white police officer in Ferguson, Missouri. Since the death of Michael Brown, the American public has become all too familiar with images of racial violence. However, Caucasian LA-based photographer Tyler Shields is drawing both attention and controversy with his latest photo exhibit featuring racial violence, entitled Historical Fiction. The exhibit features white men of power being victimized at the hands of African-American men, inverting traditional notions of power. In an interview with the Huffington Post on June 12, 2015, Shields stated his goal was to capture a scene in which his viewers, primarily white audience members, could imagine themselves as victims. Shields' exhibit provides new lens through which to view race brutality in America, prompting today's research question. How can visual argumentation through juxtaposition be used to reinterpret attitudes about racial violence? To explore this question, we will look to the model Juxtaposition as Visual Argument by Emma Bloomfield and Angeline Sangalang, published in the 2014 Journal of Argumentation and Advocacy. Bloomfield and Sangalang explore the creation of new meaning through visual argument via juxtaposition in order to challenge audience expectations, making it ideal for our analysis. Today, we will examine the thought-provoking tenets of juxtaposition as visual argument before applying them to the graphic images of historical fiction finally, drawing key implications. In their article, Bloomfield and Sangalang described two documentary films, Super Size Me and Fathead, which both use juxtaposing images in order to challenge how their audience perceives the American obesity epidemic. The authors described three key aspects of visual argumentation, deflective synecdoche, substitution as refutation, and causality through juxtaposition. Initially, a visual argument should offer a deflective synecdoche. The authors describe synecdoche as the use of a part of something to represent the whole. Unlike a representative synecdoche, which attempts to use an average example, a deflective synecdoche intentionally uses an unrepresentative example in order to draw attention to its argument. The authors point to the film, Supersize Me, in which one man, Morgan Spurlock, attempts to eat nothing but McDonald's fast food for a whole month. Of course, he does this not to exemplify the diet of the average American, but rather to draw attention to his argument by carrying out an extreme and unnatural diet. Second, substitution as refutation. Substitution allows us to envision one thing as something else in order to refute an initial claim being made. In the film Fathead, Tom Nowton attempts to substitute his own body for that of the average American in order to refute the idea of the body mass index as an accurate depiction of health. He succeeds, because although he is labeled obese by the BMI, images of him without his shirt and physical demonstrations of his well-being refute the idea of the BMI as an accurate standard of health. Finally, causality through juxtaposition. While the authors note that juxtaposition is a powerful visual argument, they explain that it is especially effective when it allows the audience to deduce who or what is causing a change between two drastically different images. They once again look to supersize me, in which Spurlock juxtaposes images of his original body with his ever-increasing body size in order to lead the audience to the conclusion that fast food is the culprit. On May 15, 2015, new media outlet Mike.com proclaimed that Shields' photos were turning America's racist past on its head. To better understand this, and with a grasp of Bloomfield and Sangalang's model, we can now apply it to the shocking images of historical fiction. First, the visual argument should offer a deflective synecdoche. Images of a Klansman being lynched by a naked African-American man are sure to draw attention. Of 
Of course, Shields does this to be intentionally unrepresentative of America's racial landscape. In this way, he doesn't take an extreme example. He creates a fictional one in order to draw attention to his argument. Similarly, the costuming of the men featured represents an everyday struggle between ordinary black men and white authority figures. Shields fulfills our first tenet by prompting his mostly white audience to imagine race brutality in a different light. Second, historical fiction substitutes the roles of the oppressed for the oppressor. Recent images, such as that of Eric Garner being forcibly restrained and choked by white police officers, contrast with this image of a white policeman being forcibly restrained by black hands, taking him out of his role of power and inserting him into the role of victim. By presenting a white audience with the real suffering brought about by racism, historical fiction suggests that white identity can come under attack and unseats whiteness that the perceived <coughs> world filling our second tenet. Finally, Shields' use of juxtaposition to reveal causality about America's struggles with race. In this instance, the juxtaposition occurs not through a side-by-side -side comparison of images, but rather the release of these photos, particularly the photo of a white policeman being attacked by two African-American men, juxtaposed in today's racial climate. The goal of this juxtaposition is to promote empathy for minorities currently facing racial persecution, thus fulfilling our final tenet. In a profile of Shields, LA Weekly wondered if he was the next Andy Warhol, or merely a provocateur wannabe. Having applied our model to the graphic images of historical fiction, we are prompted to return to our research question. How can visual argumentation through juxtaposition be used to reinterpret attitudes about racial violence? We can see that through the use of shocking images that generate strategic juxtaposition, Shields forces a confrontation of racial attitudes. This leads us to two implications. Initially, the juxtaposition of historical fiction does force a confrontation of racial attitudes, but it might also silence attempts to create dialogue. By choosing to release these photos amid news of police shootings of black men, Shields, a Caucasian himself, suggests that by participating in institutions and holding values that proliferate racism, he become complicit in maintaining oppression. However, because the display is entirely visual, with no verbal commentary to open up conversations about race, the photos run the risk of being so shocking and guilt-inducing that they actually discourage an open dialogue about racism. Finally, Shields' use of juxtaposition may inadvertently reiterate problematic racial divides. Shields, a Caucasian himself, substitutes the traditional roles of racial violence, but because this places black men in the role of physical aggressor, they may actually be seen as promoting the stereotype that African American men are violent and arbitrarily lash out against authority. Consequently, writers must be careful when juxtaposing roles that such inversions don't inadvertently feed into problematic narratives. Shields' photos are unapologetic and downright frightening, but that may be precisely what is necessary to draw attention and support to end the violence he portrays. Today, we examine the thought-provoking tenets of juxtaposition as visual argument before applying them to the graphic images of historical fiction, and finally, drawing key implications. Confronting the reality of racial violence is unpleasant, but for most Americans, the place to start is with ourselves. <laughs>